Okay, so hi, this is uh, Office Hours with the Mad Professor. I'm Liam O'Mara, um, and today I'm going to be chatting with um, uh, uh, Ivo Yachiv, and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, identity formation and how that sort of works socially. But, you know, I'll let uh, Ivo introduce himself. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I would like to start with uh, two disclaimers. Um, so I'm actually not going to speak today as a professional. Mm -hmm. because I'm not a humanist and um, a lot of the topics that uh, you discuss usually and that I agreed and would like to discuss with you are humanist topics so I will not base myself on 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 the data that people usually do when they um, you know do political science or societal science so, mm -hmm. you know draw more from personal experience but also from whatever general academic principles have been taught to me uh, since uh, I'm a doctor of ethology, <coughs> um, uh, some of the listeners or viewers might uh, know it, others might think, uh, did I just hear ethics? No, the two words have a uh, common origin in the ancient Greek word for character. But while ethics is about moral character, ethology is about what characterizes a species in terms of mm -hmm. behavior. And so, that's the first disclaimer, and the second disclaimer is that I don't represent anyone. So I don't stand here in the name of my colleagues. I think it's important to say it would also be impossible to represent my colleagues because we are politically very diverse, and in terms of societal political views, and um, maybe good to know that we all get along. So that's not a problem for us, but that's what I'm going to say about that. And obviously, I'm also not representing any family or friends. I stand here for myself. And whatever we come to talk about today, uh, I will defend myself and not try to rely on anything else. Always, so, yeah, as, <laughs> always fair mm -hmm. is an introduction, right? <laughs> I mean, that we're <laughs> not representing particular institutions. These are our views and we're just having a conversation. Yeah. For me, this is very personal. So I stand here as evil. I don't stand here as Dr. Yotche. Right. Um, right. Exactly. And... Um, I think it's also important because, uh, for good or bad, uh, what I was at the last few years, and this is based on, on hard data, again, it is my personal experience, is that things can get quite personal when it comes to politics and society. Oh, yes. And, and, and if people, you know, take an issue with what I'm saying, they should take issue with me. I'm not standing here for anyone else. That's why the disclaimer. That honestly is... Um... An interesting thing to hit at the beginning because it's always mm -hmm. fascinated me the degree to which people take things so personally. And I think mm -hmm. part of that just comes from, I mean, there's a lot of things that I sort of picked up kind of after the fact, both in my own approach to education and the fact that I'm, I'm naturally autistic. So I started off not quite cued into social norms and you know the way people would sort of like feel and perceive things for me it was sort of like an outsider perspective kind of building up analytically and because of that i think i don't take uh disagreement very personally I, i'm i'm a bit disconnected from the emotional relation to it i had i i have funny memories of being in school mm -hmm. and yeah. the way that people formed social cliques where they aligned with different teams and playing and doing team sport. And I just didn't get that at all. Like, why Why do you care? Like, oh, you're in the blue team, you're in the green team, and that, like, matters? Like, who cares? And I think that's one of the reasons that it fascinated me as an adult was that I did have to learn a lot of that later in life. I had to sort of figure that out, and it's become a lifelong fascination, the degree to which the ways that we build identities mm -hmm. and the ways that we relate to one another. Mm -hmm. Actually, this brings me to a point uh, which will be, I think, today part of our discussion, uh, because today <clears throat> you cannot discuss identity without politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> and I actually, uh, in my personal history, I actually started out um, relatively far on the left. My first friendship, friendship circle, uh, we were punks. <laughs> and uh, um, well just as a side note we also tried to have a punk band but uh, that <laughs> band literally had not a single gig but we had a lot of parties um, anyway um, and 
you, you, you started saying something, which is one of the reasons why over the last few years I've been moving slightly more to the right. You know, uh, I'm one of those people who take issue with political correctness mm -hmm. because I think it is not inclusive to autistic people, ironically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, political correctness tries to be inclusive as a method, but it's not inclusive to autistic people. Right, exactly. It's actually can be quite intolerant to the sort of, you know, faux pas that we will make without even thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of faux pas to be made, even by non-autistic people. You know, <clears throat> if, if mm -hmm. a person from Turkey or Hungary uh, comes into a city where, let's say, um, using everyone's pronouns is the norm, they will make mistakes because their languages don't have pronouns. You know, they make mistakes all the time when they speak English mm -hmm. in, in that regard. So this is my personal experience. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, we can later again catch on that topic, but just to mention it here, uh, political correct correctness has been a problem for me, uh, but not necessarily, I would say, something that divorced me with the left because I don't consider it a left thing. Actually, its history begins, mm -hmm. what I know, in the rights spectrum of politics, and it is only later adapted by the left. Uh, and that's something that generally bothers me these days. Uh, the left is borrowing a lot of tactics that used to be right wing. What I um, assume um, might be some form of, you know, psychologically would explain it like this. I have to become like the enemy to beat him. You know, I have, uh, I have to express the same form of self-righteousness, intolerance, to to intimidate them the way that they used to intimidate me. I, I think this is what is happening psychologically, and it's very counterproductive. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all, and I think that's one of the reasons that I also have a real issue with political correctness. To me, I think that people should try to be polite in social settings they should their their intention should matter we should try to be good people to each other but there are and and that's kind of ostensibly the goal of political correctness is to set up certain polite social norms so that you're not mm -hmm. offending people but when it becomes an end in itself when yeah. you spend all of your time policing language then you're not really advancing any kind of dialogue. You're not really improving the situation. But to me, I've tended to associate that a lot more with, with liberals than with the left. And I think mm -hmm. that might help uh, explain there because identity politics as a whole and mm -hmm. canceling and all of that are long-time right-wing tactics, which is one of the reasons mm -hmm. I find it interesting that in the U.S. particularly, the right is so offended suddenly by cancel culture I'm like weren't you guys like weren't you the people calling up the television station saying that you can't you can't show this like it's i don't know complaining is sort of endemic to it um where i guess from my understanding of of left politics in general is that we've tended to favor just a more broad uh solidarity and to some mm -hmm. extent, a kind of intersectionality when you can bring in uh, a, a different competing groups there, whatever, different competing struggles. But there's a sense of of inherent tolerance or cosmopolitanism that comes from mm -hmm. a, an emphasis on solidarity. And I think that where there is, especially in American politics, but it's true in a, in a few uh, European countries as well, where there's a bit of like overlap or bleeding together mm -hmm. between uh, liberals and leftists then you end up with leftists adopting liberal identity politics and political correctness. This is one of the reasons that I think that um, folks like um, Slav Wojcik are so, are so funny because he explicitly yeah. identifies on the Marxist left and he's constantly attacking things like identity politics. Uh -huh. But you know, uh, to the extent to which I'm still left-wing, I think it's very important that we attack ourselves. There's mm -hmm. a German proverb, a <laughs> plot twist, it's actually me who is German, uh, <laughs> at least by passport. Um, so um, we have a proverb in Germany, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. I think there must be something mm -hmm. like this. And so we cannot afford to have weak arguments. Mm -hmm. If we really think that what we're arguing about in our society is important, then it should matter to us that we make the best possible arguments. And intention is not enough. And I mean, this brings us to the actual topic today of identity, because 
the political correctness and identity politics, they swept over into the left because of their intention to make everyone accepted and to um, mm -hmm. integrate people. Uh, but intention is not enough. We need to also think about what really works in right. terms of um, exactly. uh, people come together and a certain level of friction is also important. You know, we, we can only become superficial friends if we always walk on eggshells. And this shouldn't be, in my opinion, a goal for any society. And um, one of the reasons is Slavo Žižek is one of the few remaining left-wing intellectuals that are still on, on my list of people to listen to. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I listen to everyone once in a while, but uh, not necessarily with the same intentions. Now, anyway, identity, where do we start there? It, it is such a big topic, and for me, it has a lot of personal right. points, but it also <laughs> obviously, as we already started drifting into it, it also has a lot of political and societal aspects. It really does. Yeah. And, and I think that's where it gets sort of complicated because I mean, and one of, one of the reasons I thought this would be an interesting discussion with you, since you want to, um, what is a, oh yeah, a truck going by, uh, since your approach to this is shaped more by, um, the life experience, because while that's what drew me into the study of identity, what got me interested in a lot of the philosophy around it and the psychology around it, for mm -hmm. me, it stayed a relatively over analytical, you know, so to me, I, mm -hmm. I look at the social relations, I look at uh, the way that the conditions shape people, you know, and, and put them mm -hmm. into particular discursive frameworks. And it, sometimes it's easy to, to lose sight of the personal side of that. You know the, uh, the the impact yeah. on on people as they as they cross boundaries and move through their well, lives. Maybe then, maybe then the way I should start is that uh, you know actually my personal history and right at the beginning, uh, the question of identity and the question of politics uh, plays a role right off the bat. So uh, I was born in Sofia, Bulgaria, in 1987, and um, I was born into. Um, soon to be divorced family and the family of my mother and the family of my father they come from two completely different camps within Bulgarian society so on my mother's side my grandparents were active members of the Bulgarian Communist Party which was the ruling party of Bulgaria mm -hmm. um, just like a decade before I was born and actually still into my early childhood we could feel or I could feel in retrospect, I could recognize that some elements of this communist society was still running. It, it didn't just end overnight. Oh, yeah. You know, like some of the books with which I went to school and so on. But good. So what I actually wanted to say. So on my mother's side, I have this um, political culture, which is communist, economically speaking, uh, but value conservative. Uh, still relatively tolerant. You know, my mother and my grandparents, they don't care that much what people are doing. They wouldn't hurt anyone for that, but they do not necessarily embrace it with super open arms. Like uh, some things can be odd to them. You know, they can be, uh, mm -hmm. let's say they're between mildly conservative and, but never really violent. And on my father's side, um, and, th and that's a funny thing, I think, for the American viewers and listeners. On my father's side, the political culture is very inclusive, colorful, but also very capitalist and free market oriented. Mm -hmm. So there we have what some people call today the classic liberal, if you so will, because right. <laughs> here uh, the capitalism is still married to progressive social views. Which people in America especially tend to forget that that's where they started. I mean, it, it honestly, it, I, I could not tell you how many times I have blown people's minds in America who've grown up here by pointing out liberals are actually right wingers. <laughs> you know, that liberalism, I mean, those that that social tolerance, the things that argued yeah. against uh, you know, slavery for women's emancipation against child labor, those were economic right wingers mm -hmm. because it's it's our, our politics have realigned. Yeah. so thoroughly in more recent decades. 
not actually. So I've been to a few European countries during my life, and I, I can actually here I can make the next step. Mm -hmm. I'll try to fast forward a little bit because, uh, and I'll start with a conclusion. So what you say is right, but also it is true that the definition of what is left and right varies very strongly between countries. Mm -hmm. That's again my Absolutely. personal experience. I'm not saying this is a humanist, but it is what I've experienced. And so, uh, the one thing I observed, and, and again, I'm starting with the conclusion, but we'll get to elaborate that in a bit. Um, one thing I also observe is that uh, the polarization that happens in the US is sometimes transported into countries that don't have the right background in order to have these ideas. They force themselves to have these ideas, you know, right. and uh, I mean, I think Bolsonaro is a funny example because uh, people try to translate what is happening in another culture by using certain labels. And so there was this like funny video I saw once where they say the Brazilian far right. And then what you see in the video is, you know, people of all colors, black and white, dancing together to samba music uh, because that's the Brazilian far right. You know, it has nothing to do with the German far right. Or the <laughs> Norwegian right. Far right. <laughs> and, and so translating these labels is very problematic. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also something that should be said about identity, you know. Uh, right. Yeah. Especially given that people have a tendency to then develop a really powerful attachment to a label like the word means yeah. something to them and we miss the fact that these words mean something else to other people that they don't have yes. the same context i also think this is probably um it's probably one of the biggest uh, misunderstandings between modern day self-proclaimed capitalists and self-proclaimed socialists socialists a big misunderstanding is that they think they use the same words, but they don't. You know, the two camps, mm -hmm. for example, in my experience, mean something completely different when they use the word capitalism. And so my impression is that there's a lot of sensible, I don't identify with any wing too strongly, but there's a lot of sensible right wingers who merely do not want a centralized economy you know, state centralized economy. And, and that's what they call capitalism. What they call capitalism is the absence of total re regulation. And that's not what a lot of leftists mean. You know, they're right. not, not what they call capitalism. And so they just keep turning circles. It's actually very mm -hmm. often painful to watch. And But another is. step is that there's confusion resulting from this, which makes people uh, who actually do not have such intentions after all, go for the wrong goals. Like you can have a left winger who doesn't necessarily consciously want to uh, remove all aspects of the free market, that they still, uh, yeah, start steering towards, let's say, totalitarian socialism, because they they merge the two meanings in their mind of what capitalism means. So, on the one hand. Capitalism is defined by Marx, also as a clear historical context. Of course, some of the problems that he described still persist, I assume. Um, I'm not an expert on his analysis. Yeah, some, some, some do, some do not. Yeah, it's, there's, still, yeah. there's still value there. But think, this is one of the things that I think is honestly a bit strange about a lot of the very emotional fighting about socialism and capitalism is that we do not live in a 19th century world anymore a lot of in a lot of ways yeah. these terms just in their classical forms or, or quote-unquote purer forms they don't really make a lot of sense but really they've yeah. always crossed lines i, I had a, a, yeah. a fun interaction I, I was like laughing myself just yesterday with you know, someone basically saying that uh, David Ricardo was a socialist because of Ricardian socialism. I'm like, no, R Ricardo was very clearly a, you know, laissez-faire free marketer there, but there were socialists influenced by it. And, and what that does is it shows us that the degree to which these things have always been more intermingled and overlapped and nuanced, but people tend to ignore that nuance and latch onto a label. Yes, and, and horrible things are happening in that regard. Um, okay, M maybe I'll first continue a little bit with, with uh, my personal relationship with identity. Mm -hmm. Because the first identity crisis then came when I was 10 years old. My mother had met and married a German guy. 
and we moved to Germany. At the age of 10, I lost my home. Everything, you know, friends, family that was there. Uh, of course, you go visit them in the summer, but it's not the same. Right. It was, it was a huge crisis, and um, it drove me into becoming more aware of what it means to be Bulgarian. That was the first effect of it. It first strengthened my Bulgarian identity before I started assimilating into the German culture. Uh, because there was a contrast, there was a realization of what is different. I developed a strong interest in culture, history and folk music during that time. Ultimately, I ended also learning one Bulgarian folk instrument, but that's a side note. Um, the, the point being that um, that's the first thing that happened. And then, um, then I started immersing into what it means to be German. Because when I was 16, 17, I had my first real friendship circle in Germany. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of my, actually my oldest friend, the one that I know the longest. And um, I don't like comparing my friends, but I think it, he deserves the label best friend as well. Um, yeah, he's German. And uh, <laughs> my, uh, my first crushes were German and my schooling was German in that mm -hmm. time. And... Um, so ultimately, then followed what led to the Bull German identity, which is also why I use on Facebook the name Bulgermanski. It actually means Bull German. Mm -hmm. uh, um, then to fast forward a little bit, when I was 20, I got my German passport. I lost my Bulgarian passport, so I'm a pure crowd by now. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to the Netherlands and I lived in the Netherlands for five years. And I studied psychology and cognitive neuroscience. I completed a bachelor and master in these disciplines, respectively. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to Germany to work for three years in what was supposed to be um, a PhD project, uh, but ended up being a very frustrating and you know, something to deepen maybe another time. Um, well, it was work. Let's put it this way. And, <laughs> and then after three years in Frankfurt, where I also had my first uh, serious uh, relationship, I moved um, to Budapest to follow my dream. Because I realized also I wasn't aiming specifically enough. It was one of many factors why Frankfurt was a horrible experience. But let's say I had specialized in animal models of neuroscience because I was interested in animal minds. Mm -hmm. I want to know what's happening in the animal head. But this discipline doesn't necessarily care that much about it. You know, a lot of fascinating things we get to understand about animal minds from the work that is done with medical intentions, you know, messing with their brain and finding out right. what its capacities are. But so in Hungary, I switched to ethology, where actually, which is actually the discipline concerned with animal behavior. And that's where I wrote my dissertation on uh, sleep dependent learning and cognitive aging in dogs hmm. and uh, also in Hungary I met my wife uh, which is a native Russian from Moscow and uh, we well we moved here and uh, got stuck in COVID uh, because we're actually our, our preferred plans is to move around a little bit more because our world is quite big and she also likes to be in Hungary that's why we met there um, so there's a lot of places we hope to share in everything. But yes, that is my personal introduction in the short form. And um, as one can see, it has to do with cultural identity. And it has mm -hmm. a little bit to do with political identity because I met all right. versions of left and right that exist in these countries, for example. And there are also interesting things to know about those. But uh, I give the word back to you first. <laughs> and they're and they're quite different. As you say, we often we're stuck using the same terms especially when people are trying to use the same languages, but we also import the terms into different languages and they mean something very different. Um, I mean, you know, the far right you mentioned in Brazil or in the US yeah. or in France or Germany, they're quite different and the things that they yeah. obsess on are different. And this also affects when people look at uh, history too. I think this yeah. is one of the things that makes it difficult for people to recognize any kind of um, uh, you know, parallels with fascism or Nazism because what they know is 
for Nazism in particular, they understand death camps and anti-Semitism, and they think that's mm-hmm. the totality of Nazism, and it's really not. The target mm-hmm. can change. It's the the political psychology that's mm-hmm. that characterizes it. But we get obsessed with the specifics, and the specifics yeah. don't translate mm-hmm. well. They don't cross borders very well. Exactly, which is why actually in my personal experience, you know, I'm not trying to shit on your field, but uh, in my personal <laughs> experience, I, I don't uh, like too much uh, the fact that people try to draw a clear line. Mm-hmm. The most radical imaginable right and the most radical imaginable left. Um, and there's something here that should not be misunderstood. You know, some people will immediately recognize, oh, this is a proponent of the horseshoe theory and the horseshoe theory is bad. <laughs> But yeah. so for me, it is not the case that they're equal. You know, the, the farthest right is, I don't know how, how it is visible with my hands. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. I'll have to stop trying to, uh, to uh, gesture. But the farthest right is obviously worse than the farthest left. But they both can pass a threshold that is unacceptable. Right. And, and that's how, for me, the horseshoe theory works out. It is not that they're equal. It is that there's a line, at least for me, uh, which shouldn't be crossed, and mm-hmm. both can do it. One can go deeper than the other, but they both can cross this line. Mm-hmm. And this is why we need to understand what makes people violent in general. Like, uh, even right. seen some of your lectures on fascism, and I learned some interesting things, but I also had some critical thoughts. And, well, basically, um, in my opinion, first start maybe there what really makes for a genocidal political ideology is not so much the content and the ideas because a lot of people actually are larping they're not really (laughs) zealously believers of whatever they uh, identify you know there might be contents within fascism that if you lived it out to its final consequence it would always result in a hitler-esque nightmare but ultimately people do not uh, most of them do not uh, live out things into the final consequence uh, and they do not necessarily understand the final consequence of what they believe that also I've seen a lot where people and this is where why um, things like Holocaust denial are so common on the right because yeah. you don't want to connect something that you deeply feel to something that yeah. clearly has this negative consequence and that yeah. can and, and when we look at that sort of like from the outside, it kind of looks like, oh, you're just LARPing as a Nazi because you yeah. don't really get what it means. But yeah. in some sense, they do. And I think that's where it's um, uh, more there's there's more of a deep kind of um, a personal or emotional attachment to certain things. Yeah. It's not always very um, intellectual. And fascism yeah. and, and many philosophies, actually, um, and some other philosophies of the right, too, but fascism in particular it doesn't mm-hmm. actually have a lot of intellectual components to it. It's mm-hmm. more a set of, of feelings and cultural um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, alignments than anything else. I, I think if you look at all the historical examples, you're absolutely right. Uh, but the problem that I have with trying to construct the science around fascism uh, is something that you said right at the start. A lot of fascists do not identify as fascists. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is something that happened historically, you know, after Hitler, nobody wanted to identify. <laughs> well, that's kind of the, the problem, yeah. So, um... yeah. But, but there's also a scientific problem here, you know, methodological problem, because it means that you always have to come and define it from outside. Mm-hmm. So whatever becomes the scientific consensus on, on what fascism is can be abused to label individuals or groups fascist by blindly following a checklist. And um, I think there's a certain risk in following checklists in general. Mm-hmm. But we can have it a little bit more about this in a second. I wanted to not forget something important here. Yeah, because I was actually trying to say what I consider personally the biggest danger of an ideology becoming genocidal is something very simple. It is self-righteousness. You know, whether you're left or right or middle, uh, mm-hmm. if you're absolutely convinced that what you believe is worth killing and dying for, then that's your entry door to genocidal nightmares. And to violence really in general. I I deal with this in a lot of classes where we're talking about the the development and evolution of different religious traditions because people Mm -hmm. will come into that study frequently with very hard opinions on things. 
they'll, yeah. they'll understand Islam in a certain way or Christianity in a certain yeah. way. And what I have to help them to understand is that in neither case, you know, just using those two common examples here, neither of the religions themselves are inherently violent, but when you connect mm -hmm. them with political power and a kind of, you know, a, a sort of fervent belief in it, yeah. then the politics sort of corrupts it. So Christianity absolutely can be genocidal. In fact, most of the oh, yeah. people who participated in the Nazi genocide were not doing it because of the racial theories of the Nazi hierarchy. Mm. They did it because they grew up as good Catholics or good Lutherans. So of course we hate Jews and, and they can kind of align with that. It started with, a, a, there was already a bit of a, a separation for them. You know, something yeah. that you could, you could build on. Although uh, here we might have our first disagreement of today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, um, and I'm saying this, however, with, with a certain note of caution. I, I think that religions can differ in the risk, intrinsic risk they carry to become violent, which I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say this in any strong sense. You know, I'm not saying that... Um, I'm not saying that every Muslim is a head-cutting barbarian or every Christian is a God-loving churchgoer who never does harm to anyone. Obviously, that's not how it works, and, and we can see that this is not how it works. Um, but I think certain thresholds are more easily crossed when certain things, you know... Uh, let me put it this way. One, one problem I have with Islam as an idea is that the book was literally written during time of war. I mean, Mohammed was fighting off people that were trying to kill him and, and get his religion removed from Mecca. And so the entire story takes place during a battle. I mean, this is quite unique among religious texts. Uh, neither Relatively. Jesus was literally in a battle field, nor Buddha or whatever. I mean, this is quite There's unique. a lot of um, a battle and violence in uh, the Hindu, you know, the uh, yeah. sacred text. But yeah, but, but those two are quite distinct in that element yeah mm. i mean and, i'm not trying to bash muslims here you know i have muslim friends and uh, <laughs> i know a lot of people would say that but uh <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to, to bash muslims and i've met some amazing muslims in my life uh but but you know the way i would put it maybe, maybe what i could say in a politically correct frame is i'm not blaming Mohammed here you know i'm not saying that Mohammed had bad intentions you know, I'm not the most religious person on the planet, but let's assume for the sake of argument that he was really visited by God and he wanted to bring over a good message. Now, it simply is bad luck that Mohammed found himself in a situation of battle and writing down his story ended up, you know, describing much of that battle and, and all of the things that happened during war. It, it is bad because we know from psychological studies that the mere presence of, of pictures depicting weapons or mere presence of weapons mm -hmm. can make people more aggressive. And so it does matter if your religious text has more allusions to violence. Right. I think what, what I would uh, what I would do there, uh, where I would introduce a little nuance into that, is that yeah. on the one hand, you have the psychological impact of hearing these stories repeated over and over when you're sitting around, you know, afterwards, you know, and, and, and the imam is telling a story and it involves a fight. Um, because the early Muslims were being persecuted by the Meccan polytheists, whatever, there's, there's a conflict going on there. There, mm. there is a violent battle. Yeah. And what ends up happening there is because of that, that being present in the text, it can override what actually when people focus on it educationally, when they dive deeper into the message, there, the point of the text is is that Muhammad is himself anti-war. That the point for him is to end the tribal divisions, end the blood feuds, yeah. bring people together to say that we're all common humans, and even if we don't share the same faith, there's still no compulsion in religion. We should not be fighting each other and killing. Yeah. And but it's the mere pre the fact that he happens to be in war overrides yeah. the social justice message of Islam. So exactly. it's and, and that for me is why I I, I tend to argue that it's not the religion it's often our yeah. education uh, in them it's the way that texts are viewed it's the way particular images come through and certainly you can see it in, in christianity too uh i mean yeah. uh, jesus is clearly a pacifist um yeah. 
and, and clearly in many ways apolitical, doesn't really care about the Roman occupation, but the simple fact that he lived under occupation and was executed for treason against the occupation does have an impact on it. And no, the fact that no, there's really. no real discussion of the politics made it easier for people to develop a kind of militant piety that linked it mm -hmm. with Roman political authority, which could then crush anybody who didn't share the belief, despite yeah. the fact that that has really nothing to do with Jesus. So again, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's the not the religion, like it's not the, the yeah. Christ-like elements that's the problem, mm -hmm. but it can be understood differently if based upon the images you use, the stories you use, the yes. examples you use. Yes. And, and, you know, you're absolutely right there, but what complicates the issue even more is that it's very hard to pin down how important is the text, you know, because the argument they just made obviously focuses only on the text. You know, it mm -hmm. says the text is more risky because it involves more violence, you know, in, in terms of being misunderstood. Right, but, it, it, but again, it depends but on how you okay. use the text, too, because the same text that shows all of the violent imagery also mm -hmm. says there's no compulsion in religion, you know, we're all equal, God created all of yes. this diversity intentionally, and who are you to challenge that? There are so many statements yes, no, of is. peace and social justice present in the text that complicate yes. it. So I think it depends a lot more than on the, the social context. You yes. know, we see a lot more violence today in the Muslim world, and this, I think, challenges a lot of people because it's tempting to see it as endemic to the faith rather than consequences mm -hmm. of the corrupt political and economic situations, the, the histories Definitely. of colonialism and violence. If it you take the more like the long durée on it, the Muslim world has historically been less violent than large parts of the world. Certainly, um, you know, if we look back at the conflicts yeah. amongst like different Hindu powers or the conflicts yeah. among Christians, yeah. Christians were far more likely to conquer other people and force their religion on them than Muslims were. In the no, contemporary world, we don't see it that way because yeah. we've got now centuries of of movement towards secularism in the Christian world, yeah. which tempers, you know, that so sort of one, fervent one religiosity. Thing, sure. One thing though that has to be said about Christianity is that it, it you know, the, obviously Christianity, uh, whatever was good or bad about it, definitely could not prevent all the territorial conflicts in Europe. But one thing which is interesting is that increased um, the number of social conventions that people had to, um, how to say it, they had to adhere to when they were fighting each other. Like from the history of my country, it is known that uh, Bulgarians and Serbians, when they went to war with each other, Bulgarians and Serbs, they had mm -hmm. rules that captives were not to be killed. Mm -hmm. and The carrying away of wounded should be uh, permitted without interruption. Mm -hmm. The rules were always followed is another question, of course, but the, right. the point that uh, these rules were justified in the written texts uh, with common language, but also with common faith. So the common right. faith, this Christianity network was very important for uh, trying to move away from this bloody reality, which they ultimately inherited even from before uh, becoming Christians. And um, Another example is that actually the Vatican tried to ban the use of the crossbow because it was such a deadly weapon. So it is probably one of the first moments <laughs> in European history right. that an institution is trying to ban a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> and um, but you're absolutely right. And you know, I, I even can think of myself. I had started reading the Quran, you know, in in the German translation and. I remember there was a surah, I think it was a table surah, which I liked really much because the way I understood it, it was actually arguing that uh, indeed, I think you actually implied it, but I'm just going to repeat this specific part. I think in the table surah, they say that uh, if God wanted us to all believe the same thing, he would have done so. You know, the different mm -hmm. faiths exist for a reason and he wants exactly. to test you whatever he gave you. So yes, you do have in the text uh, the core for uh, for peace as well, yeah. Which it also has affected. The, it's it's driven the same sort of um, of phenomenon. There are specific rules that 
um, Muslim armies had to follow. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. if a city did not put up much of a fight, they actually explicitly banned any kind of looting, which is unusual in the, the late classical mm -hmm. period in conquest. Generally, when you took a city, you tore the holy hell out of it. Think about what, uh, you know, like the Venetians and whatnot did to, you know, Constantinople when they took oh, it in 1204. Yeah. They looted the holy hell out of the city. Um, yeah. You know, so there were, um, there are different rules, but um, we have a tendency, and here's where identity gets funny again, too. Well, we, sure should quickly, we will understand uh, more from a particular perspective or history than than, uh -huh. than another, too. It's Yeah, but first of all, a little side note, uh, the, uh, the Knights of the Fourth Crusade, which sacked Constantinople, actually were excommunicated for this, um, as far as I remember, to whatever, you know, to whatever... Uh, extent some of the uh, severe court. abuses were yeah but but uh, the other issue that they wanted to state is now let's just for the sake of argument however in spite of all the complexities assume the unpleasant assertion that the different religious texts of the world differ in the extent to which they are associated with violent imagery even then the issue remains complicated because um, there seems to be also uh, a shifting context that influences just how much people try to live by the book, if you so will. Mm -hmm. because we have and, how, and how they interpret and read the book, yes. Exactly, because we have clear examples of, of people um, being you know, relatively uninfluenced by their own religious texts. Let's say, uh, <laughs> absolutely no <laughs> causality there. You know, and I'm saying this because one of my friends, with whom we also have a lot of uh, deep discussions, um, he studied comparative religion, uh, he's from Krakow, and uh, he likes to say, uh, I think it's a bit of a radical statement, that the text doesn't matter at all. You know, that's his mm -hmm. position, the text doesn't matter at all. But I don't agree with this, because mm -hmm. um, what did the Hussites fight for? The Hussites in, in Bohemia, they were fighting for having the text translated into the native Czech language. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the text matters, but when and how it matters is so hard to predict. We, which is why, right. even if we assume that there are differences, it still remains complicated. And this is where I, I sometimes bring up in religion classes too, that just boiling it down to the text as a kind of concrete object is problematic because our understanding of the text shifts and changes. We can reference the same text, the physical words will not change, but mm -hmm. the same book will mean something different from one generation to the next. People don't yeah. generally use New Testament to justify slavery anymore or to justify yeah. keeping women out of the workforce anymore. But it's still yeah. there. I mean, you can do mm -hmm. it, but our use of it shifts. And the context mm -hmm. drives that a lot. One thing you, you can point to, especially with the um, the more militant aspects in early Islam, where you have the, the yeah. sense the the, um, the, the militant or, or lesser jihad, the, the, the violent parts that are in Quran, mm -hmm. um, actually fade away as significant in Islam for many centuries until the, the time of the Mongols, because there was no one actually persecuting Muslims, so there was no need to defend the community. They were kind of on top. As soon as yeah. these, like, you know, Tengri worshipping pagans are pouring in, they're like, oh my god, and then suddenly Jihad yeah. makes a big comeback and becomes very violent, yeah. and then it fades away again as a significant issue and then comes imperialism you know you know the, yeah, the, the imperial yeah. period and now you have you know people trying to draw on those violent um mm -hmm. aspects of the text and they, for them those become very important the jihad aspect yeah. of what muhammad was doing becomes very important and the social justice stuff fades away but take away oh, the yeah. complicated circumstances where they feel persecuted mm. or lost or abandoned or whatever and those disappear and instead the the aspects of like brotherhood and helping the community and whatnot become the dominant one so the text can mean the same thing across different generations to different people like it, it can in terms of like their emotional attachment to it mm. but the meaning of the text like what it actually tells them can shift mm. over time well, uh, to be honest, obviously, because I already mentioned, I have Muslim friends and I value them a lot, and even colleagues, and you know, and um, rather my issue should be specifically taken with the interaction between having such a text and having the phenomenon of hate preachers. Because my problem is, you know, for example, 
when I was living in the Netherlands, I go into this place where I would order food. It was owned by some Turkish Muslims, and the guy who owned it, such a nice, you know, middle-aged to almost old man, uh, he once told me, I believe in Islam, you know, I'm a Muslim, but I have no problem with homosexuals, whatever people, everyone should be happy how they want. Nice, you know, I was perfectly happy, but I had to ask myself, you know, in the back of my mind, because he also said during that uh, expression that he never read the Quran. However, he was raised to respect that book. You know, this is part mm -hmm. of being a Muslim. You have to respect the Quran. Now imagine you have such convictions, but someone comes to you and you happen to be able to read yourself and then they show you the book uh, and they, they show you and they say, your tolerance is wrong. It is written here. He could not have known. He, he never read the book himself. That's what he himself admitted. So what happens in such situations is also a bit unpredictable. It is. You know, uh, and and those, again, a, a lot of people who follow any of these faiths can be variously connected or disconnected from them. Uh, yeah, one of the things I think that fascinates common. me in, in like, mm -hmm. I guess, the study of extremism in terms of the political psychology of it is, is for me, the, the degree to which it actually transcends the cultural and religious boundaries that you can find yes. it anywhere like the the single most violent terrorist group um in our modern history is actually a christian one operating in central and east africa you know they have by far they have by far the um largest death you know death toll but we don't tend to associate you know christianity with violence in the same way in those christian yeah. dominant cultures even though the faith can clearly be manipulated to it based upon those circumstances you know or or you have plenty of places where again you mentioned the, the tolerance there too okay so um sweden is an officially christian country <laughs> most swedes yeah. are not terribly religious um and it's very yeah. open and tolerant there but you can flip open you know any christian bible and find it again condemning homosexuality in the same way that quran does like literally yeah. to the same degree yeah especially in the old testament and i mean and it's it's interesting how that shifts mm -hmm. over time too so there's long periods mm -hmm. in different parts of the muslim world where there is a tremendous amount of implicit or and explicit tolerance of alternative sexualities of alternative gender identities i mean the uh, the yeah. persian amrad concept the erastes and eromenos were basically adopted into the ottoman turkish world into the arab world i mean people totally accepted mm -hmm. that there were these particular types of homosexual relationships even though the quran says this is haram you can't do it yeah. you're like well what everyone knew everyone knew rumi was gay like everyone knew rumi was gay in the same way that people knew that leonardo was gay you know Know? But well, you, know, this nice you can kind thing, of, you know, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and ignore it. Yeah, sure. But there's, you know, this Brazilian proverb: uh, "To my friends, everything; to my enemies, the law." So <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, and and um, and you find that the political circumstances often really affect things. So uh, I don't know. To and I, I see this as a as an interesting phenomenon repeated over and over in different countries. That when a society feels in some way. Um, politically mm -hmm. threatened mm -hmm. it tends to cultivate a bit more intolerance yeah. so where you had a tremendous amount of um, tolerance across religions towards like you know, you know Jews and Christians and whatnot in Mamluk Egypt mm -hmm. um, you know, the Mamluks even had wanted to ally with the Christians against the Mongols I mean like you know they were they, they were pretty tolerant towards religions didn't really care but late yeah, in Mamluk but, history yeah. when the state was was shrinking economically and threatened by by yeah. the Ottomans and was willing to be conquered it started um, forcing Christians and Jews to wear distinctive clothes and to make them stand yeah. out and you start seeing overt persecution that was never really there before the potential yeah. existed for both tolerance and intolerance, yeah. but the circumstances cause different ones to rise to the fore. True, true. And it is definitely also the case that... Um, I lost my thought there. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to share two things here, because, you know, to, to keep also the connection to identity and, and personal stories. Mm, yes. And that's a rather sad one, and it shows that this radicalization very often can happen for very personal reasons and you know i knew someone who wasn't really that much of a friend he was really just an acquaintance uh he was working as a nurse in frankfurt 
and I think he was of Somalian background. Mm-hmm. And you know, I met him maybe two, three, four times in my life. And he was a Muslim, but he was very relaxed, very liberal. We we were smoking joints together, you know, th- mm-hmm. that kind of liberal. Uh, and um, one day I've been told uh, that this guy went completely radical after the death of his mother. His mother was extremely religious. So after she died, he went through a personal crisis. He became extremely religious, but in such a bad way that he actually went over and joined ISIS. <sighs> and that's when he died. He was killed on the battlefield as a soldier of the Islamic State. A guy who was, you know, working as a nurse and smoking joints in his free time. You would mm-hmm. never expect that. You know, this is right. why I don't like it when some people look down on people who are afraid of Muslims. You know, all the complexity acknowledged, all the uh, humanity that we all share, things are sometimes unpredictable. And, and, and people do not know what to expect from each other because they also don't understand the entire... Right. Each other, we don't understand the different cultures, right. the different religions, and, and it's hard to understand what people also go through too. And it's interesting exactly. how much, how how easy it is to cross certain boundaries and thresholds too. You you mentioned so right. the, the so-called Islamic State, you know the uh, Daesh right. movement as it was growing up. One of the things that sort of fascinated me about it when it when it then took root in in Iraq um, during that mm-hmm. the occupation and insurgency there, there were a lot of people who were former fervent committed Baathists, which mm-hmm. is a secular leftist Actually, movement yeah. that spent decades oppressing religiosity that tried to suppress a fervent religiosity yeah. and they went from being Baathist, you know functionaries mm-hmm. and, and soldiers to being soldiers for the islamic state because it's the circumstance that kind of like mattered more to them, the, the personal yeah. circumstance of the, the war, the occupation. Here's the force that's actually fighting back against it. Okay, cool, I'll align there now. Yeah, I've, I've even been told, and I could not fact check it yet, so we have to take it at face value. I've even been told that regular European atheists have been joining Islamic State as mercenaries. Because they were bored and they wanted to do violence. There are, yeah, and and there are Americans who do that sort of thing too, who you know, end up yeah. becoming soldiers of fortune in different countries around the world, and often align with you know, yeah, you know, various ideologies mm-hmm. in the process, because the um, the circumstance itself is what fascinates them. There's there's plenty of people who get, I, I don't know. This is this is one that I think is sort of interesting on the left. There's a kind of like romanticization of the uh, the fight in in Syria with the Rojava. Mm-hmm. Um, and they see it as a, an opportunity to kind of like replay their childhood fantasies of like the Spanish anarchists or something. And this is a chance to go and do yeah. that. And they miss the internal complexity of uh, yeah. an extremely um, heterogeneous environment with quite a few different languages and cultures. And the fact that they the alliances shift, that they're working with different people. You know, I mean, the same kind of leftists who will, you know, bash the CIA endlessly Mm -hmm. in the u.s then identify with rojava which is taking direct support and working with cia you know um it's it 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 gets really complex you know the entire political body behind and around rojava is also very complex for me to grasp because uh, there's some complicated history between turks and kurds and uh, and arabs and kurds yeah yeah, exactly. And, and now it's fashionable in the West uh, to think of the Turks as the ultimate bad guys who, who always did everything wrong and the poor Kurds are the victims. Actually, it's so much more complicated. The Kurds it really were so is. Active. The Kurds were so active in the Armenian genocide mm-hmm. that that they should be co-blamed if that was to be you know, officially accepted. It doesn't matter. I mean, Rojava is so complex because there's obviously measurable... Um, good aspects of it you know i like how they like to promote the image of gender equality mm-hmm. you know and as we progress to this to this conversation you might be surprised to find me being in many regards maybe conservative for some of, of the viewers tastes but the the rojava uh, promotion of gender equivalence I, I think is something very important in the region culture politically speaking even though it's obviously also a bit of propaganda they they do get sympathies and they know that they get sympathies for that. So the whole Yeah, there's a long history of it in the area though as well that we also tend to 
to forget. I mean, there were significant socialist and communist movements across the Arab yeah. world that did also make those same kind of arguments for broader tolerance, solidarity, you know, the emancipation mm -hmm. of women, whatnot, but then get drowned out by other conservative voices based upon the different circumstances. I think what's interesting, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the Turks, and yeah, it does become very fashionable to sort of like hate on, on people, and you end up associating yeah. a whole culture, a whole nation with a particular idea, when the problem yeah. with with uh, is with certain actions and ideologies. So what we see during like the Armenian, Greek, Syriac, you know, uh, you know, Assyrian genocide in, in the late Ottoman period, mm -hmm. is radical nationalism was the problem, not that they were Turks, you know. And Kurds identified with that as well and went after like local enemies because to them it was an opportunity to expand their territory. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. the two groups, I mean, because the, the Kurds at the time, you know, uh, saw an opportunity. So they had yeah. very different motivations than the radical nationalist CUP government did for doing it. And then yeah, yeah, a, yeah. a number of ordinary people could get involved yeah. for various reasons. It's not yeah, as simple as saying Turk yeah. bad. It's no, there yeah. are specific issues and ideas that are the problem. It's also, you know, so sad that I, I notice that a lot of times when I discuss with some people, for example, Ataturk, and Ataturk gets blamed for being somehow connected to the Armenian genocide, and that's just a historic. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Absolutely. Ataturk, Ataturk actually, in fact, wanted to punish some of the perpetrators, but then uh, the circumstances changed such that it made politically more sense to unite everyone. I think the pro and, and exactly and, and the trick there is is the um, the shared nationalism, you know yeah. that the Ataturk's movement was explicitly a Turkish nationalist movement, and mm -hmm. the CUP's um, genocidal policies came out of a Turkish ethno nationalism. So while Ataturk might have a more mm -hmm. cosmopolitan orientation, it made mm -hmm. sense ultimately to ally with people you know who had those sort of reactionary views. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and this is, by the way, very interesting because uh, the um, the ethnostate idea was mm. originally, by many of its initial bearers, uh, some form of well-intended social justice movement. Like the, this, for example, this historic figure in Bulgaria, uh, his name is Kapitan Petko Vojvoda. You know, he um, mm -hmm. was actually so much opposed to treating people differently that after Bulgaria was liberated, he, and he was fighting really hard for that, you know, with, with, you know, shooting people and hiding in the forests. He was an actual, you know, freedom fighter. And he transiently joined Garibaldi, where he was trained even further, and then returned to Bulgaria as, uh, you know, a student of Garibaldi, who was uh, doing something similar in Italy. And, mm -hmm. and now, in, in the Bulgarian context, after Bulgaria got liberated, and all the Bulgarians started, uh, or a lot of Bulgarians, uh, excuse my generalization, a lot of Bulgarians started to take it out on the Turks, you know, time for revenge. He became a lawyer who defended Turkish farmers from mm -hmm. losing their land. So he was a nationalist. You know, he believed in the ethnostate, he wanted the ethnostate, but he seriously believed that the Bulgarian ethnostate would treat the two groups more equally than the Ottoman Empire was able to. You know, he right. saw that the Turks cannot do it, uh, to put it so bluntly, because Ottoman Empire is actually not Turkish. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a multi-ethnic corporation. Um, but he he believed that the Bulgarian ethnostate would take better care of treating the different groups differently. Right, and we but, tend to forget the, um, the historical well, links the between that, nationalism and liberalism, that they were yeah. actually originally frequently connected for people. There's a kind of um, built-in contradiction there, and you can see why it gets heads off in different directions. But nationalism, there there are forms of nationalism that are much more inherently tolerant or cosmopolitan, and do see a sense, a sense of solidarity. I had a conversation recently with another uh, fellow um, mm -hmm. where we where he, he raised the question of like um, Irish nationalism and how Irish nationalism was actually connected yeah. to leftist. You know economic mm -hmm. concerns and to helping out other peoples you know in other in other in other areas like yeah. so the, the solidarity with like, you know, palestinians methods, for yeah. example that sort of thing um but it is still a nationalist movement well, sure. but we tend to associate nationalism only with the much more uh reactionary or exclusionary because yeah. nationalism does involve a kind of othering there is a sense in say even in the bulgarian nationalism where 
your Bulgarianness is defined by speaking <laughs> the Bulgarian, by, by having a particular yeah. cultural identity, which does yeah. sort of make, you know, um, Turkish speakers and, and, and Roman, you know, the Roma, whatever, sort of like they're, yeah, um, exactly. they are outsiders to yes. that identity. Yes. Um, this is something that a lot of nationalists could not see themselves. This was not mm-hmm. what they were aiming for in Bulgaria. Right. Today, today, their good quotes are forgotten. You know, when, when a right. guy like Vasil Levski says that the enemy is not the Turk, but the Sultan, the people forget about that. They, they just like to celebrate. Exactly, the, yeah. The it ends up, who, you, you end up with the worst possible aspects of it. Um, I, but that's the interesting we, thing, you know, because uh, reactionary, you know, fits here very well. Sorry to interrupt mm-hmm. you. Because, no, no, uh, by all means. Originally, the, the ethnostate idea, and this is also a topic that has a lot to do with identity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know it's it's very similar to what we see today with identity politics, in my opinion. And I'm, for some people, I might right now be making blasphemic comparisons. But ultimately, the whole idea of an ethnostate was to be a safe space. You know, what a lot of ethnic groups realized is that their, their rights and their um, well-being were not guaranteed in the multi-ethnic empires that existed. And so before the nation state idea uh, started blossoming uh, that was the reality of, of europe for many many centuries there mm-hmm. was no state that was based on ethnicity right. in europe and because the ethnic groups realized that if they're part of many other groups and if they happen to be not the strongest group inside the state they will be trampled upon they reacted hence the word reactionary uh, uh-huh. yeah, the yeah, no i again i i get you safe space. it's yeah, sort of exactly. like the the picture is so much more nuanced than we do tend to have time to, to deal with it as the the big mm-hmm. empires on the one hand have to be understood as much more inherently cosmopolitan or tolerant because they are polyglot multi-confessional they are diverse but mm-hmm. the lar- the numerically largest group does tend to push around others and if you care yeah. about your local identity or local language you can totally feel trampled there which means that mm-hmm. the push toward a nationalism in that sense is a push toward you know real um i don't know it really is founded on a kind of like respect for that the sort of difference and you're kind of right to make a comparison to the whole safe space idea that it is like here's a nice little place where we can be alone our language can be dominant and our culture can be dominant and we don't have to worry about competition with it with a a larger framework but it very easily can be twisted into an extremely violent because it does still involve that othering. It does still involve saying, yes. we are this and you are that. And in some yeah. minds and with some context, it, hello, <laughs> it, can, uh, um, it can immediately lend itself to a kind of violent exclusion rather than sure. an inherent tolerance. There's so many places where I, I, I yeah. find that, I mean, I mean the same thing we're looking at here with the this use of, I mean, I, I can't uh, help making a, a brief parallel because you can think about the way that so many of these early nationalist thinkers were actually more focused on tolerance um, and, mm-hmm. and respect than on exclusion. Think about the way that we look at um, the Saudis today and the sort of like mm-hmm. Wahhabi ideology and just how ossified and, and rigid it is and how, you know, like, you know, get the, the morality police chasing you in the mall because your, your clothing isn't quite right. And yet... Yeah. Um, if we actually go back to the text, you find people like Ibn Abd al-Wahha basically saying, we have to make those choices for ourselves. We have to look at the text ourselves. The idea of the morality police wouldn't make sense in that sense. Uh-huh. It, it's uh-huh. it's really more like um, it's it, it, in itself, in its own context, is a reform movement. But we yeah. always lose the sense of nuance that 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 comes along with it. The things are never as simple as they tend to look. Nationalism, I think, is a great example of that. Where yeah, but I think here the, again comes the uh, one of the things uh, that I, I was throwing in earlier, um, because the content of any ideology is not the best predictor for violence. You know, there's very powerful yeah. other circumstances that play into it, and obviously also self-righteousness. Right, exactly. You know, so individual psychology and our yeah. beliefs in psychology matter, and and the, the circumstances matter far more than um, than the ideolo- ideologies themselves. They and, and, and you see the self-righteousness. You see it sometimes even in the good guys, like mm-hmm. this guy Petko Vojvoda, who was really interested in treating everyone equal. He actually believed that Bulgarians can do that better than Turks. 
<laughs> uh, he was disappointed mm -hmm. that he had to, you know, step in as a lawyer and defend the Turkish farmers because he expected better from his countrymen. You know, right. one quote, which I don't know if it belongs to him literally because it is part of a movie made about him. One quote he said, uh, a allegedly during a court hearing is but this is why we went fighting you know this difference between bulgarians and turks that was made by the ottoman government this is why we took up the gun we cannot continue with this you know our country should be better you know, he actually believed that bulgarians can be better and, and this is this um right yeah and, and know, so in, and at its core the there's core. um I, I guess one of the reasons that for me then um i do take some of it back to the ideas themselves, um, and I would draw a distinction between the motivations of the person having it, because at its heart, the idea still does involve a kind of othering. It does still involve yeah. drawing a distinction that has yeah. a, a chauvinistic element to it. So no matter how yeah. well-intentioned someone can be, certain mm -hmm. different circumstances can bring that chauvinism to the fore, and yeah. those can be end up being violent. But you know, I, I think one of the things that's sort of interesting, too, that we often forget in the development of nationalism, especially since technically we will always date it to um, the French Revolution and to some extent the American War of Independence is the first like really modern nationalist kind of uh, movements, mm -hmm. especially since in the French Revolution, most of the major techniques of it, you know, um, mm -hmm. education, conscription, you know, the, 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 the common yeah. language, that kind of stuff really start to develop. But it actually, no idea springs fully formed out of a vacuum. They build up over very long periods of time. And a lot of the yeah. initial push toward creating distinct national identities as a political unit comes mm -hmm. out of the wars of religion in, in yeah. Europe, where people were slaughtering each other over minor religious differences. And they started saying, well, you, you know what? Maybe we should care much more about our Saxon or Hessian or <laughs> Neo Tuscan identity than we should care about whether you have, whether you're Calvinist or Catholic. Actually, the evil or you know, it does have some good aspects, although I admit that the othering is always at the core and it's always a risk, you know. And, um, mm -hmm. but the evil, or whatever you want to call it, has a very long root in Bulgarian history. And this is a very ironic thing, because Bulgarian history starts out as cosmopolitan as you can imagine it. Two very different groups managed to get hold of Byzantine land, you know, land that belongs to the Eastern Roman Empire, and they make it the new home. And these groups are as different as you can imagine them. You know, the South Oaks Slavs and Bulgars, right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The Slavs were uh, farming people, solitary people uh, who came from the north of Europe. They were rather pale people compared to uh, Bulgars or Byzantines, one assumes at least. Uh, and the Bulgars, they came from the heart of Asia, from, from mm -hmm. Central Asia. And they were horse people and they were very warlike and much more raw. Right. You know, uh, Byzantines also describe these two groups very differently. You know, they, they say do. very nice things about the Slavs in spite of being constantly at war with them. They say the Slavs are hospitable. If they take a hostage, uh, he is allowed to stay with them or he can return back home after a while. They say nothing like this about Bulgars, Avars or other horses. And then there's should... like Khan Krum, you know. <laughs> okay, let me... you know and they... They make we, a skull let me drink cup. from your skull. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. yeah, there, exactly. there's a certain understanding of them that's a little different. Yeah. Yes, and maybe even multiracial because I mean this is a bit a point of mm -hmm. controversy between different historians. But uh, we have some reason to believe that part of the Bulgars looked uh, East Asian in appearance or at least mixed, so uh, much more than than the Slavs anyway. And so we have all this diversity. Mm -hmm. And now happens the following interesting situation: at some point. The Bulgar government, which is mostly the Bulgars, you know, the Slavs are just the creating class, they're the farmers. Mm -hmm. Bulgars are, uh, you know, providing protection from other attackers, but demanding taxes. So uh, at some point they realize the Byzantines will always try to take back this land. That's a problem, the Eastern Romans. So first political decision made by a certain uh, Tsar Boris, uh, was that uh, he adopted Christianity because he wanted to become part of this bigger network of European nations that at least deal a bit more civilized with each other during war. And, you know, what I described earlier, so he wanted to become part of this broader culture to secure some international rights for his dominion and to be acknowledged as a king. Mm -hmm. But at the same point, um, this resulted in a significant risk. 
Because ultimately, they settled for Orthodox Christianity, which was the same belief as in the rest of the Eastern Roman Empire. And because a lot of the people living inside Bulgaria were not only Slavs or Bulgars, many of them were actually former Byzantines, it could generally strengthen a sense of shared identity with the Byzantines and thus weaken the resistance to Byzantine Reconquista. Mm -hmm. And so Boris did something amazing that both nationalists and leftists today would not understand because he genocided his own people in order to create a unique identity that would not merge back with the Byzantine Empire. How did he create it? First of all, Bulgars and Slavs all had to accept uh, this new faith and thus lose part of the original culture. And then he literally genocided all the nobles with their own families that resisted the Christianization violently. Interestingly, farmers who took part in the revolt were let free to go back home. But the nobles it's were a... killed with wives and children. Yeah. So he, he genocided the Bulgars in order to create a new identity. And the other aspect is mm -hmm. he took over the Cyrillic script, which by that time nobody wanted to use. This alphabet would have disappeared. But he realized its utility in translating the Bible into Slavic. And this was the political move that created a shared and at the same time unique culture of the people living in Bulgaria that they had the that they had the church using its own language. They were not using Greek, not Aramaic, not Latin, none of the acknowledged classical languages. They were after the Goths, they were the first to have the Bible in their own language in Europe. And thus, because all of this happened in the ninth century, this is how far back the nation state can be traced back in Bulgaria, because this is what effectively happened. The diversity was destroyed in order to make the country more resistant. The government knew that right. sooner or so later... Like, so later, later nationalist movements could draw upon that history in constructing yes. a modern nation-state identity because they had a longer national history. And yeah, yes. it, it is one of the interesting reasons. So, I mean, you get this you, um, both in... Um, Bulgaria and in, in Hungary. If you look at you know just genetically at the Hungarian population, they're indistinguishable from the the surrounding Slavic peoples, but they maintain mm. that Hungarian language, the Uralic language, you know, of the elites who came in, of, of those conquerors. Yeah. The the Bulgar language disappears. You know, I mean, it's mm. one thing for like the Tengri religion to disappear and the culture to, to Christianize, but all traces really of Bulgar culture go away and are replaced mm -hmm. by a South Slavic culture, and and that really mm -hmm. is. The you know the the genesis then of a much more coherent sort of national identity, but in even in cases like that, you're always it 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 has a lot to do with the surrounding context, you know, with the mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. need to distinguish and to to stand out, and then it has this kind of like violent othering that's part of it. Yeah, clearly this was a extremely violent process. Yes, yes, and, and it's one of the you know it. So on the one hand, it's preserving an independent cultural yeah. identity on the other hand it does so by violently suppressing anything outside of even, it and you could even argue you know why i choose to say that he genocided his own people you could argue that uh the process of of the slavic becoming the dominant language and displacing the bulgar language was very much helped by adopting the cyrillic alphabet which was created for the purpose of translating the bible into slavic so obviously it was likely not the only mechanism at all here, but mm -hmm. basically it was decided at that point that it will become an official language, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you're going to translate right. the Bible into Slavic, uh, because the, the letters fit it better. Um, but who knows? Today even the Mongols yeah. are using Cyrillic letters, so maybe it would have worked. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> Mongols, Kazakh, yeah, exactly. You can adapt it to anything if you have to. It's, I mean, but it always there's weird changes that have to be made to, to do them too it's i i think it's fascinating just what i mean to a lot of of lay people um mm -hmm. arabic and persian and urdu all look the same because they start with the arabic script but there are distinct differences because they're adapting them to a language that's actually quite different before we continue just a little break we'll be back in two minutes okay. or one, maybe only <laughs> but i have to like i'm gonna get some coffee too <clears throat> excuse me Thanks, cat. Here, so good opportunity to Get up for a second. I had to, we're in very yeah, different time exactly. zones. I'm still getting coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was finishing with the. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know how much time we have, but 
where we just ended up brings me to a point I was hoping we would also cover today, uh, which is also a concern of mine uh, with the use of the concept of privilege in, in modern identity politics. Mm -hmm. My concern also stems from a comparison with this history of ethnostates that we brought up. Um, my concern is that ultimately calling a group privileged is literally a framing. It is one way to say something that can be said in two different things. You know, if, if you have, let's say, a class of children in a school, right? And uh, the teacher constantly mocks one of the children and they're, um, you know, giving them bad marks and whatever mistreatment uh, they can think of. Uh, you could say one of two things. You could say, the child is being mistreated, or you could say the other children are privileged. And I, I think the second framing is dangerous because, and that's something that happened in the Balkans, it happened with us. For us, the Ottoman Turk was privileged. You know, we regarded this group as privileged because Muslims actually objectively had more rights in the Ottoman Empire, had to pay fewer taxes, uh, were earlier on allowed to wear weapons, um, and so on. So there was the idea of the privileged Turk, which was historically correct. So my problem is that it doesn't matter if it is objectively true, right? Because it could be that the group is in some way privileged, but what happens is after a few centuries, and, and I like to think in these big time frames, mm -hmm. is the Bosnian genocide. You know, why, why did the Serbs massacre the Bosnians? It's, it's a complex situation. I don't understand all of it, but one reason is because they were associated with the Muslim elite of the Ottoman past. Right. <clears throat> the Bosniaks were self-identified Muslims. So let's say, I don't think any of these framings is per se wrong because they're both possible. This is the definition of the word framing. But I think one of them is riskier than the other. And I often don't see it. It has brought to me, you know, I've came into a lot of discord with some of my more left-leaning friends because of refusing to accept the whole uh, privilege narrative. And for me, it's simply unnecessarily, um, yeah, in inviting potential for conflict, which maybe only will unfold hundreds of years later. This is what happened with the Ottoman Empire too. But nonetheless, why should we take this risk? Right. I think the um, one issue that really comes up there, and I think this is true in a lot of discussion around framing and we do this a lot and i certainly do this a lot in trying to help people to understand and contextualize our own uh, american politics um but mm -hmm. you can apply this in tons of other situations and certainly it fits the um the situation in the balkans and the the atrocities there what you end up doing on the one hand in trying to recognize power structures because people and people frequently on the left and in academia what they're interested in is recognition of the power structures because they can see the broader um socio-cultural and economic and political forces that are pushing things along but for most people identity is a very personal thing that doesn't really have to do with these forces most people are not taking the view from ten thousand feet they're yeah. dealing with this and what you yeah. end up with doing is, is whilst on the one hand, somebody is, for the right reasons, trying to explain the systemic power structures that are harming someone for someone else, it becomes a personal attack and builds a sense of resentment. And yeah. that resentment can boil over. Um, so a lot of, for example, the, um, the framings around privilege, you know, in, in the, again, the American context, a sense of like white privilege and white male privilege, mm -hmm what it did was it directly led to the far right backlash, you know, that's been building for several decades in the U S yeah. because instead of understanding where it was coming from and, and why they were trying to do it. And that ultimately just mm -hmm. equality and getting along was the goal. What it did was it built a sense of hostility to people. Yeah. So what, what I think happens frequently is that people just simply talk past each other. Yeah, That's one of the things. One of the reasons that I'm I'm I've been studying political psychology for a while. One of the reasons I'm actually in that Facebook group and where we where we met is, I'm interested in the way that people get so caught up in a particular discursive framework that they're utterly unable to understand where someone else is coming from, and they just uh -huh. talk past each other like their words have totally different meanings. 
they do. You know, if, if I talk longer to someone who is using the word privilege in the, in the American sense, in the American way, you know, uh, then we do manage to, you know, ultimately arrive at some point uh, where I at least understand what was meant, even if I might reserve my disagreement. But um, so this is something that happens in person. And you mentioned this funny group where we met, you know, this group, uh, I cannot talk for everyone, but I literally go there to be the worst version of myself. You know, <laughs> I don't care mm -hmm. about having civil debate when I go there. Uh, right. You seemed also not to, even though I don't know if it will or not affect your research, but maybe it is just a tricky part of it. I don't know. The point is that um, this group is a fight club. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, it is, it I, and, and, and it's it, it gets back to something you made a point you made early on about a lot of the uh, the sort mm -hmm. of Nazi LARPers that are out there, too, um, yeah. because, you know, I'm in a number of these different political groups. And mm -hmm. in some of them, you do have people taking really horrific positions. That I'm sure they would never take in person. There yeah. is some degree to which there is a kind of sympathy towards it because they're willing to to at least articulate that, but there's also mm -hmm. an element of irony, an element of, of, of hyperbole, you know, where they're, they're exaggerating the positions in order mm -hmm. to cause conflict, in order to yeah. provoke yeah. a reaction from the other person, because what they want is the fight. Yeah, They, they want the clash. You know, and I think I, a lot I, of that I, fight club culture yeah. builds up around the fact that outside of these specific groups, we are still taught to think in ways that inherently alienate other people that that get us talking past each other you know no, but we... also, you know one thing i noticed um I, I did my own experiments which i do not plan to publish in this group which is on some days i wanted to be a slightly better version of myself and i decided okay i'm going to say something about a certain topic and i'm going to formulate it in the least possible uh, in a controversial way. And I consider myself someone who's rather good in writing, you know, and nonetheless, you will always find someone who will jump on it mm -hmm. and you can see that they're disagreeing for the sake of disagreeing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just the way they go there. You know, it is exactly. And, and I think it is not good for the polarization process, even if it might turn out to be a purely internet phenomenon. Uh, because it's also something I've considered over the last years. You know, uh, I'll admit here something very openly, which often doesn't get said in, in a lot of political debates that I've been having the last few years. Information these days is creating created more quickly than I can fact check it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not being paid to dig that deep into political and societal issues. So, and, you know, my time is also distributed across a few things and you know if if we discuss now slip spindles which happens to be one of my core topics as a scientist they are you know brief bursts of brain activity you can measure with eeg generated by the thalamus i'll stop here uh, the point being um, there i can even tell you which papers make which mistakes and why it is a mistake and how they miscite right. each other and so on i have i had the time and i had the we all have our different areas of, of knowledge and expertise, yeah. Exactly. But when it mm -hmm. comes to everything else, and, and this is a danger I see today, uh, we don't have time to fact check, you mm -hmm. know, and I often have to use heuristics. I'm going to try to quickly go through a few examples. Forgive me if I jump across them without uh, yet allowing time for reaction, but I'm just trying to illustrate another point here. Mm -hmm. um, for example, there was this debate on the gender pay gap, right? And I'm not an expert on these things. For God's sake, I have no knowledge of economics uh, and how economics work. So I have to use a heuristic in order to have an opinion. You know, God knows why I need to have an opinion, but okay. So <laughs> <laughs> That's now, a question I think a lot of people should be asking themselves. <laughs> true. Now, here's what happened, you know, a heuristic. I'll give you an example. Um, I see some people say we have a gender pay gap and then they show some difference in, in money amount. Then some other people come, obviously slightly more to the right, or if you're not lucky, very far to the right. And they say, no, but if you adjust for X, Y, Z, then the gender pay gap doesn't exist. Now, what I'm always hoping for 
is that the other side will come up with a new argument and explain why X, Y, Z uh, shouldn't matter or how mm -hmm. it is interacting with some other variables and then ends up uh, being a serious gap after all. You know, I'm hoping for this and when I don't see it, Mm -hmm. Then I'm sorry, I tend to take the side of the people who don't believe in the gender pay gap. Because what the initial statement uh, group did very often, at least in the beginning of this debate, is that return to the original statement. You know, someone tells you, if you're just for X, Y, Z, there's no gender pay gap. And the people who brought it up, they say, no, there is. Okay, but what about X, Y, Z? You know, like, tell, tell me what's happening there. And that's one example. Uh, right. where I have to rely on heuristics, you know, I'm not a humanist, I don't have time to dig into the exact economic dynamics there. Um, one other issue, very funny story, by the way, uh, and that's also heuristic. For a long time, I tended to be very skeptical about all the criticism towards Trump, because a lot of the criticism that came to me, and maybe that's just selection bias, you know, what I ran into, was very exaggerated, very emotional. I, I have a natural antipathy for emotionalness when it comes to these topics and debates. So if, some, if someone is arguing very emotional, I tend to not believe them. And so, but one day, I got really angry over Trump because one day I see a video where uh, Trump is allegedly making fun of George Floyd. You know, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. This, this was the content of the video. And the text was saying that he was making fun of, of George Floyd. And I went for it. My first reaction, and I wrote it down, is that I was angry at Trump. So all my initial skepticism faded away because of a smartly manipulated video, because that actually never happened. Someone posted the original video, and it was about something completely different. Trump wasn't talking about George Floyd at all. And then you ask yourself, what do I actually the fuck know about Trump or his opponents? Everyone mm -hmm. is making such videos probably on mass all the time. Right. And you see that uh, it's a, I, I love that you mentioned the emotion aspect of it, because one of the things that sort of fascinates me is that both sides of the debate will often see the other side as more emotional. Yeah. Um, you'll see the, the very defensive kind of like coming from the right, you know, defenses of Trump. And they are able to overlook any of the legitimate problems because there's an mm -hmm. emotional commitment there. And then on the, on the left, then you have a desire to exaggerate every possible thing mm -hmm. and make him into this, you know, this, this sort of monster there because it also fits a particular emotional frame. And in both cases... It's the emotion and where they stand to begin with that matters much more than yeah. the facts. So yeah, I, I think I think I think one of the things that stands out in that first example um, that uh, you gave there of uh, like the gender pay gap that's sort of interesting, and I see this a lot in um, both in-person conversations as well as like in the media and political, you know, mainstream political discourse as well as in these kind of like little quote-unquote debate groups, is that people have learned only a particular way of explaining something. They only understand it in within a particular set of frames. So mm -hmm. neither side is really able to step out of that discourse and understand where the other person's coming from. What are the person who has the you know, X, Y, Z you know, objections to it? They can't see where the other person's coming from and haven't learned those arguments. But on the other side, they haven't bothered studying the rhetoric of the other side. They haven't bothered studying those arguments and never learned a counter. They'll fall back on the yeah. same argument that they already know because to them it makes perfect sense. And what you end up with is people on both sides assuming that the other person is an idiot when it honestly has nothing to do with intelligence and everything to do with framing. Like yeah, how you exactly. understand something. If you can exactly. take an, a, an issue or argument that you have and you can frame it in a way that makes sense to someone else psychologically, you can yeah. get past those, those d d things. But we, we, don't, we don't teach that. Well, part of the complexity of all the situations is that um, people forget that prejudices are very often mutual. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, right. there's this myth that there's this one side that you can trust a little bit more than the other. Uh, and we forget that actually there's a lot of people out there for whom the go the end is more important than the mean so you know the person who made this video that made it look like trump is making fun of george floyd 
he probably had the best intentions, you know, for this person who is convinced, you know, that that Trump is uh, is the devil. Right. To him, he's trying to highlight a real problem. But to do so, he is, you know, manipulating and lying about something to do it. So the intentions. Objectively right. You know, that's the that's the sad thing. He might be objectively right about Trump being a problem, but that's that's uh, become the (laughs) that that he is. Right now, I'm more scared about the fact that. Again, information is being created faster and can be fact checked. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, people are extremely willing to do whatever leads to a good outcome from their perspective. Well, this brings me to another thing. You know, I, I liked some things that you said very much in the debate that I watched. You had a debate on, on fascism, and you said there's something uh, which I agreed with, but I also want to add something to it. Maybe you implied it, and I just missed it. You know, you were saying how the Republican Party's fascist tendencies have killed the conservatism in the U.S. There's no proper conservative representation in U.S. politics. At least that's what I remember, what I understood. Yeah, it's there's a tiny wing left of the Republican Party that's conservative, but its its dominant orientation is much more around the social yeah, issues, the nationalist issues, the populist issues, yeah. and um, interestingly enough, there it's easier to find what we would consider a classic conservative position in the Democratic Party. I tend mm-hmm. to associate the Democratic Party as the conservative party, uh-huh. and the Republican Party is not. Um, it, it, what it gets lost there is that there's a small vocal minority in the Democratic Party mm-hmm. that still wants that kind of like centrist or center left view. You know, your your uh-huh. uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortex. Sort of like, but she's sort of like out of touch with a lot of mainstream liberals. Because mainstream liberals actually have what would be a much more classical kind of um, Burkean mm-hmm. conservative. Mm-hmm. Well, look, um, I, I, I would add the following side note to this observation, and this at least my maybe maybe wrong. You can tell me, but I think conservatism in the U.S. is not dying only because you know of the reactionaries in the Republican Party. But there's a complex mechanism in which these mistakes influence how others view conservatives. You know, it becomes extremely unpopular for people to voice conservative opinions because they get associated with the reactionaries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, And this is, is, by the way, why I'm very much not a friend of all this analysis, political analysis and societal analysis who try to look for dog whistles. Uh, the problem with the dog whistle is that if you want, you can always find one. You know, it's it's for me, it's the same thing as with Freudian psychology. You know, <laughs> if you if you want, you can always find, you know, the sexual motive in, in a human's behavior. That's what Freud did, and and you can always twist his concepts around that it ma- makes it fit in the end. And so it is non-scientific. You know, the problem with 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 dog whistle concept is that you can always see it if you want to and that's not how it should work you know we need how to say it first of all we need falsifiable hypotheses about dog whistles if we really want to look at them but there's another reason that they don't care about them because if someone um if someone doesn't dare to directly say what they actually want to end up with they're most likely not going to get it you know, I, I, I have a lot of respect for my ex, but if I may say something negative, and it's actually not just her, but there's some people in my life who, you know, didn't really say what they want. They tried to imply it, and I just remained like a stone, you know, like, speak up, you know. Yeah, I think what's it, going on. I'm I think it works a little. And, and that's why I think the dog whistle is useless, because if you have a suspicion that someone holds a much worse view than what he's saying, let them come out. You can do it. You can, how to say it, you can provoke them into speaking their mind. If you can't, then their opinion is useless because it's just an opinion that they hold for themselves and they can never really voice it. They can never really influence others if you cannot make them say it. So we have to forget about all this dog whistle theorizing and the search for dog whistles. We, we have to provoke people into saying what they really think. And, and then we can 
hit them, you know, if they're wrong, verbally, preferably. <laughs> yeah, on um, I could. The only place I guess I can come to an agreement on that is I think that it's useless in the sense of raising it with people. In the same way that I think that it is pointless generally to tell someone that what they're doing is really racist. You know, like you're, you're mm. calling them out on it because what it does is it provokes an emotional reaction. They dig their heels in and they don't actually mm. change the racist behaviors because mm. they identify their own behavior with who they are to such a degree. You know, it gets back to that whole question mm-hmm. of like identity and no one wants to be the bad guy. I mean, mm-hmm. really, I mean, Hitler and Stalin were not the bad guys. They were the good guys in their own narratives. Everyone is always the good guy. So it's yeah. you don't want to see that... Um, that dark side to it that someone else is seeing. So it's useless in the mm-hmm. sense of of dialogue with people, right? Mm-hmm. I think analytically they work because the uh, what, what we're doing there is we're focusing on on outcomes and actions, which is what sort of makes them falsifiable. So um, is 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 Richard Nixon and, and Ronald Reagan racist in their in their um mm-hmm. in their own attitudes or whatever? Are are there were their goals racist? Um, we can say factually yes, even though mm-hmm. they're going to contradict that in public and say I'm not racist because the specific mm-hmm. policies proposed and the specific internal discussions had identify that. The, 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 the so-called war on drugs that became such a big deal in the U.S. Mm-hmm. was consciously developed because they knew it would provide a tool allowing the mm-hmm. police to go after minorities. And yep. the outcome of that is empirical. The outcome of that is a yep. massively disproportionate prison population, even yep. though every single study shows that drug use is evenly spread across the different ethnic and racial groups in the U.S. We all use yep. at the same rates, but minorities are targeted. So mm-hmm. we can say that the person's goal was racist because the outcome is still and at that yeah. point, what you're able to do in, in the, the purpose then of the dog whistles, and I, I, I get the, the sort of Freudian um, parallel there, that you can mm-hmm. obviously read into things. And this is where um, the analysis of it is very complex. It should not be left to just any random joke. This is why I don't like a yeah. lot of the, the dumps of people's emails that people start pawing through. Oh, did Hillary say this or that? You know, like Because you don't have the context. You don't have the expertise to actually analyze documents and put them into their context. Yeah, when a particular sure. group that favors a particular set of policies that do mm-hmm. empirically have a racist result use yeah. particular coded language in order to appeal to that population to get them to support them or vote for them, that's an identifiable dog whistle. Where the social sure. values as a whole, you abs- even if you, if you said it out loud, even a lot of those racists wouldn't support you anymore because they understand on some level racism bad and they don't think of themselves as the racist but yeah, if yeah. you use the coded language what happens is it plays entirely unconsciously it's not something that someone is sitting there saying hi i want to support this person because i want to lock up black people it's just yeah. there's an unconscious fear these are the kind of people who like cross the street when there's a black person walking because on mm-hmm. some level they don't really trust the difference it's, it's but they really... can't they won't acknowledge it in their own identities because I think, personally, you know, we could get into very crazy waters here because I'm one of the few psychologists who actually do not believe in the subconscious or unconscious for that matter. But it's a very complicated and long story. Hmm. Um, I'll try to put it simply. Um, I think some of our beliefs and opinions, rather than existing subconsciously, they actually come into existence when we try to analyze ourselves you know because sometimes behavior is actually driven very simply you know there's a certain stimulus there's a certain statistical association between that stimulus and some emotion of yours for some personal history reason and then when you come to um you know when you come to reflect on that you might end up with different interpretations which then become real you know they were actually not there before but let's say and in that sense, you can actually become a racist, but not initially being one, because ultimately, and, and that's sadly true, there are people who are very consciously racist. You know, if you see some of these mm-hmm. interviews with Ku Klux Klan people, they're not mm-hmm. ashamed of it. 
Right. You know, and it's not pushed anywhere, but because they've come to accept it as a necessary evil, you know, I think it's right. a, a lot of point of big disagreement. And I think a lot of people have a different tolerance level for what is a necessary evil in this world. We all know that we don't live in paradise. And but we all, you know, tend to be sometimes very taken aback by the fact that someone else um, is able to accept more of the evil that happens around us. And so these people, for example, they have chosen to uh, tolerate the fact that they're not tolerant. Yeah, that, that is, I think, what is so rather than rather than sort of like suppressing that or or rationalizing it, they they're willing you know, to embrace it. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, just to add something here, maybe as a, as a more meta conclusion, I think um, you can forget about getting rid of prejudices. You know. What you should try to avoid, and this is actually not my own thought, it's the thought of my oldest friend, is ressentiment. I don't know why he chose these words, but I'm going to explain him the way that he means it. So prejudice is when you have any kind of prediction about the world based on your experience, right? And you're going to have those predictions. But ressentiment is the actual problem for society in his view. Ressentiment is when, uh, in, in his understanding, is when you meet an exception to your rule, and you actively refuse to accept that this is an exception. You know, you you basically, you force your perception of the group on the individual. And that's where you're starting to do harm. Because actually, if you think about it, we do not need to have the same opinions about groups and individuals, because these are two completely different levels of analysis. Mm -hmm. Why should I have a positive view of all the groups that exist? Nobody has. I mean, even even a lot of well-meaning, you know, liberal people do not necessarily have a good view of conservatives, mm -hmm. partly because of how they associate them with reactionaries. Right. Now, so you don't need to, but you need to be able to acknowledge an individual as individual, you know. If you meet... Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually so trivial and so such a truism that uh, I, I feel... Uh, a bit of shame for trying to spell it out, but uh, for me it is simply that, you know, whatever I think about, for example, we had it about Islam a little bit earlier, you know, but the Muslims that I know, my opinion about them is formed by who they are. It is not whatever ideas I have about Islam as an idea, you know, for me, Islam mm -hmm. is an idea that you should be able to criticize, and I have my critical concerns, but I really value those people. I've actually learned a lot from them, also in terms of revising some of my critical views. You know, one of them is a scholar of, of Islamic philosophy, and um, he shared a very interesting analysis online where he was showing how different schools of uh, thought in Islam regarding law, mm -hmm. uh, by, by which sources they were influenced. And so these schools... Right. Have very different conclusions, but they were basically all using the same literature to the same extent. And this, for example, helped me to overcome my obsession with the text matters. You know, the risks about which I spoke about the text. You know, he, he presented me data, and I accepted it. Or, in other words, there was my exception, and I had to revise my worldview. Um, I think prejudices are only dangerous if we don't admit them to ourselves and we don't analyze them but and i think that's in many ways the um the deeper problem there because you're right in, uh, to, to some extent that, that prejudice is itself not something we can get rid of because ultimately it's born out of our own particular exposures what we're around what we know what mm. we've learned who we've been with so i i know people who've come out of rural parts of america and have never run into hispanic people before you know the only mm -hmm. black person they've ever met was like you know somebody who was being carted off to prison they have no exposure at all where yeah. you know i grew up in very cosmopolitan long beach with all these different ethnic neighborhoods and meeting people so to me there was nothing scary about it but yeah. the difference can be scary that that prejudice is simply a reflection of your own lived experience where it's dangerous mm -hmm. is when they become part of systems and mm -hmm. the problem, I think, with a lot of the, the discourse back and forth between left and right on issues like this is that 
the leftist is tend or, or, or and, and the academics and whatnot tend to be talking more about the systems, and they can sometimes mm-hmm. make mistakes and bleed over and and be talking about people, but they're really the subject of their analysis are the systems that have been produced by mm-hmm. prejudice, um, whereas anybody who's taking it on a much more personal level. You know, if it's yeah. not an acknowledged prejudice, if it's not something they've thought about, then certainly they don't think of themselves this way. I, I think that it's yeah. actually productive to get people to stop using the term racist and stop thinking in terms of this person is racist and talk about actions and policies. So this yeah, particular yeah, yeah. view you have is racist or prejudiced. This particular action that you've taken is prejudicial and, and hurtful. Because as soon as you turn it into um, a description of a person, Mm-hmm. As soon as you say, this is racist and you support it, ergo you are racist, then you have mm-hmm. somebody that has to build up massive layers of cognitive dissonance to block that out because they don't see themselves that way and they don't identify with that villainous idea. And it's not yeah. a, a prejudice that they're able to acknowledge. And we, I think we need to meet people where they are and recognize that. You know, that someone yeah. shouldn't be forced to... We shouldn't be forcing people in a situation where they have to admit that they're the bad guy. We should be focused yeah. on the toxic idea that they're passing around. Or maybe even really just on the positive stuff, if that's possible. You know, because... Um, one thing that is generally a faux for, pas for here... Oh, God, I don't know how to pronounce these French words... Uh, well, yeah, actually, you had uh, ressentiment really well. And, and actually, you can ask your friend about this. I would be very uh, surprised if that didn't come out of an understanding of Nietzsche. Oh, he is. He was a big Nietzsche fan. Okay, then, the 60s, then that's, that's exactly did. why he adopted the French word ressentiment for that <laughs> process. <laughs> Interesting. I, um, yeah, at that time, I was reading Nagarjuna, and he was reading Nietzsche, and we were having a lot of discussions around both thinkers. Um, anyway... Um, Look, another thing that is happening here is, is simply that uh, next to everything is said, which also plays a role, is also this element of you're telling another person what he is, you know, mm-hmm. and we usually don't do that. Right. You know, it's not just about saying that they're racist. You could even go and say to the person that, you know, you look like someone that likes flowers. You know, it would be equally disturbing because you just run up to someone that you don't know, you don't know their personal history, mm-hmm. and you say something about them. Um, this is very dangerous about this uh, strategy of dealing with the problem. Yeah, uh, in, in that, I, and that I agree because it, <laughs> it, it, it crosses the line then into a sense of personal identity and, and self-conception. And since, I mean, really for, especially today, you know, here we are in the 21st century, most people who are themselves directly supporting what we can call racist policies are not doing it for an explicitly acknowledged racist reason. If there is a sense of prejudice mm-hmm. in the reason for their support for it, it's generally not something that they're able to acknowledge anyway, and it's not a part of their identity, which means as soon as we deal with it as if it were a part of their identity, you've already lost the discussion, you've lost them completely, sure. there's no way ever to to resolve yep. the ultimate problem because everyone's going to dig their heels in and, again, talk mm-hmm. past each other. Yeah. But there's also another element here which, which troubled me right from the start of when this polarization became conscious to me that we have in our society today. And this is that I think some people on the left completely exclude the possibility, and I think it's a possibility, that someone can support or even suggest a racist policy for non-racist reasons. Right. No, no, that, again, that's, this is, this is true. Policies have several consequences at once, mm-hmm. you know, usually. Policies right. have a complex effect on the world. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, some arguments that you could make are so much longer and more complicated that most people want to take time for. You know, I was considering, right. for example, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm necessarily embracing this, right? But for example, the whole idea of, of banning uh, people from Muslim countries coming into your country, mm-hmm. that was a discussion in the Netherlands even before the migration crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have yeah. a very... Mm-hmm passionate guy he's he's called Herr Wilders Mm -hmm. Uh, he's himself ironically quite cosmopolitan in background he has Indonesian and Jewish ancestry and um, and is married to a Hungarian woman anyway uh, this guy in my opinion 
is just a cultural chauvinist, you know, and that's how he also views himself, but there's actually no right. evidence that he's a racist. You know, he's a cultural chauvinist. He doesn't like the Muslim culture. Yeah, and like and that, Whether honestly, logically. it gets to a really, um, another one of those fuzzy areas about the use of language, too, because we mm -hmm. are often caught up in thinking of race as if it were some kind of objective feature, and it's not. Race mm -hmm. and nation and culture and ethnicity are all inherently flexible terms. We used to use those mm -hmm. terms uh, much more in, in, Euro in, uh, in European history, you'd see it. You would refer to the French race and the German race as distinct yeah. races, and we don't use those terms anymore for them. They're, they're, those are fading the, away. Um, the, degree and, to which, the degree to which people try to tie the concept of race to anything biological or not is the very flexible part. Right. On the other hand, uh, let's say for uh, for lack of a better word, I find the word race is sometimes very useful to say in a very short way that people tend to look different from one region of the world to another. You know, it, it, it can be used in theory as a synonym for uh, a set of features. As long as it's understood in a, as long as it's understood in a relatively flexible way in itself, because I mean, just yeah. biologically, the, there's more diversity genetically within any racial group than there are between the racial groups. You know, that there isn't actually a huge amount of a physical difference, but there are distinct characteristics that show up in certain areas. Clearly, populations yeah. whose ancestors have lived closer to the equator for a long period of time are going to be darker. Duh, that yeah, just exactly. has to be the case. And exactly. we should be able to acknowledge that without saying it's necessarily prejudice. I, I do that in, in classes. I help people to understand, yeah. like, pointing out that someone is black is not racist. You know, yeah, exactly. discriminating against them, saying that there's some uh, somehow a, a fundamental difference between them. That's yeah. where the racism comes in. Um, Although, you know, I would sometimes wish the whole race and anthropology science would be more... Um, I'm going to make a very controversial argument here, so bear with me. Uh -oh. I wish it was more uh, publicly accepted because certain questions that people have, there are already people who are going after those questions. You know, like if you want to know, is there only any correlation between, you know, some genes or whatever makes your appearance and some other genes that might drive your behavior or temperament in some way? You know, there's people who are studying this, but by making it um they say publicly taboo because this branch of science physical anthropology has been abused a lot you know mm -hmm. don't repeat how much it has been abused the scientific but, racism and everything yeah, mm -hmm. exactly but if you make it a taboo as a topic in general one possible negative consequence is that all the literature that exists on it will be written and and, and created by racist assholes because mm -hmm. everyone who thinks that they're let's say everyone who has a different bias because let's say that reality is even more complex than, you know, adopting one of two options. Everyone who has a different bias, who is more inclined to, to not see fundamental differences, they will not even bother themselves with this topic, so they will have no influence on the literature on that topic. And so if someone is genuinely just curious, they will only run into the racist shit. Right, and honestly, I can I, I can agree with you there, and I and I have frequently pushed back within my own profession uh, against mm -hmm. the sort of allergy we have toward evolutionary psychology, just in general. Mm -hmm. That the the because there's this tendency to turn the social constructed aspects of our identity into uh, the the only aspect of it, and to deny any kind of. Um, yeah. of inheritance um, in the same way that you have the sort of the, the essentialists making the argument that the, cult, the, the the context doesn't matter it's just all biological or something I mean they're they're honestly they're both wrong the, um, obviously they're both wrong you the, know the, Freud as a child I realized that it is impossible for any group uh, however you know biologically defined to be inherently criminal mm -hmm. because what counts as a crime you know many of the crimes are actually uh, socially constructed. Mm -hmm. So, so it is impossible for evolution to create a group that has a instinct for crime. Like that's something right. that right off the bat I can say we will not discover. You know, we might find some other interesting correlation between appearance and character, but we will not find this instinct for crime that the Nazis, for example, believed in. Um, or 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 American racists do all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand. 
because temper is also heritable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it is true that if you're a more temperamental person, you're probably more likely to commit a violent crime. But that's not because you have an instinct for crime. It's because the temper you have will more likely put you in a situation where you may become violent. Yeah, and it's yeah. and it becomes very difficult to, to separate the um, the cultural inheritances and the social inheritances yeah. from the physical ones. And I think you're right in the sense that as a taboo, and I can understand the reaction that made it a taboo because of the mm. eugenics experiments, you know, the 1920s, 30s, yeah. 40s are so horrific yeah. and also factually wrong mm -hmm. that it does um, keep people from looking at it. And that does mean that the people more likely to do research into things like intelligence or criminality tend to be the prejudiced assholes. Um, mm -hmm. And that itself makes all of that research essentially garbage because their perspectives are, are, are uh, affecting it. I think that yeah. these are areas that do need to be explored a bit more dispassionately. And I think that yeah. the, to the extent that they have been, I think that there is no strong correlation on, on any of these things, whether you're talking about criminality or intelligence or whatever there, that I think a lot yeah. more of it is going to be uh, in terms of the basic circumstance, but I don't think that we ever can resolve the questions yeah. or or fundamentally yeah. disprove the racists until people yeah. are able to do that research themselves yeah. without being assumed that they're a racist for doing it. You know, we, we have to be able to explore the topics yeah. to show you know what that and means. You know, you, you know, we we have to. You know, people are sometimes afraid that we might find something that might push us in a certain direction. But regardless of what we find, if we open ourselves to all possible questions, it doesn't force us to adopt any particular consequence. It doesn't have, and, in the and first that's, instance, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the first instance, we just want the information, right? And then right. whatever we discover might still not mean what we think it means before we discovered it. You know, and that, that's something that, uh, you know, that's, that's something I, I think that I learned from academia and I very much love that I learned it in academia is to love the question more than the answer and mm -hmm. uh, uh yeah I, I think and we do tend to assume uh, that certain consequences are inevitable for things but they, they they really aren't at the end of the day they still have to be social choices and yeah. we have a tendency and this is one of the things that also complicates a lot of discussions between people with differences where, where identity comes in is we assume that things require a certain value judgment and I, I, I have these conversations a lot trying to bring together people who are leftists and liberals and conservatives and get them to understand that that being conservative is itself not a problem it's it you know the the conservative tendency co-evolved with the liberal tendency it's it's always going to be there there's nothing inherently wrong with the person in, a, in moral terms in intellectual terms they just are what they are and the mm -hmm. best way to deal with it sort of socially is to be able to understand the different morality in play, the different framing in play, because someone being conservative is not ne of necessity going to create the kind of social outcome that the leftist or liberal is afraid of. In the same way that the conservative can be terrified of the leftist or liberal because they think that the ultimate outcome is to abandon all culture and toss all history and it'll be this you know, uh, you know crazy, weird, utopian model. And that's not true yeah. either. Both have radically weird in many ways um uh, conceptions about the the consequences of the other's views because they're applying a value judgment to that to a yeah. to a difference rather than simply discussing the difference in uh, perspective and, that, and that's actually also a good example of the slippery slope uh, mm -hmm. fallacy right on both sides but i think people on both sides uh, in some weird way are at the same time right and wrong you know, like, yes, the, the dramatic consequences you just described for each wing, they can happen. And they have historically happened here or there. But I think what is crucial here to remember is that ideas don't kill people. People with ideas kill people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, exactly. Context, circumstance, right. I mean, it's one yeah. of the things that's sort of fascinating about the way that people i mean you mentioned the the discussion i'd had on uh, on neo-fascism recently mm -hmm. it's it's interesting the degree to which people have difficulty recognizing the parallels because the circumstances are different and the consequences are different 
mm-hmm. you know, because it's not leading to this particular consequence that they associate with that idea, then they it can't possibly have anything in common. Their idea must be completely different. And it's it's really not. Yeah. There's a, a much more complicated interaction between identity and circumstance and ideology. You know, mm-hmm. all three of them are distinct, different things, but yeah. they interact with one another. You know, yeah. and they're through their interactions they can lead to those horrific consequences, like the way that we've seen with certain ideologies. Yeah. But just as the in the, the nuance I, I was trying to bring up with with Islam, it's not Islam yeah. itself. It's the yeah. it's it's a confluence of things that that lead you into yeah. particular areas. And as you you mentioned with your your friend who's a, a scholar there, I, I've often put that same point. I, I take taken that same point and I, I try to tell people that there isn't Islam, there are Islams, plural. Mm-hmm. Like there are yeah. radically yeah. different understandings of the same text and that diversity has always been there. Yeah. So but, when we take a certain you know, monolithic view of yeah. things, it kind of shuts it out. And whether That's true whether it's Islam, whether it's conservatism, whether it's anything else. Yeah. If you project onto it a particular monolithic view, you're unable to talk to somebody. Yeah, exactly. But you know what? I noticed in many times, in many discussions I had that were less civil, <laughs> ironically with people that they know better. Uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, um, what very often happens is that we become each other's reactionaries within a dialogue. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've catched myself saying horrible things about Islam in in conversations because I was reacting. To how the other person was going about the topic. To, yeah. They themselves, right. you know, they themselves are reacting to something that they assume. Right. You know, they, yep. One the, reaction that is very The Islamophobia can lead someone yeah. to apologetics where they cover up all the bad parts and then and, and then that leads somebody to be much more Islamophobic and it just and it creates a feedback it, loop that pushes yeah. people apart. And that's why I I I'm, I'm always falling back in this whole talking past each other idea. Because yeah, exactly. each is framing the issue differently and they're refusing to recognize the concerns the other has. The apologist does have a legitimate concern in the way that pe- oh. the Islamophobe is framing yeah. something. The Islamophobe does have a legitimate concern in that there have been violent issues. You know, I mean, there there is something yeah. that needs to be discussed there. But yeah. a- until people are able to recognize where the other's coming from, the conversation yeah. just isn't productive. It just ends up, you you trigger yeah. each other. And people yeah. fall into the stronger and stronger reactions. <laughs> and, and I think the social media is totally not helping. No, definitely what not. Often, what you can often see about um, about debates like this, for example, you know, about Islam, or not about Islam, but let's say about the refugee crisis, mm-hmm. is the people who want to help, they constantly post pictures about women, and children, you know, the things that, that get you to, you know, feel really bad about the people that are suffering. And the people who are opposed, they post pictures on some really strong and intimidating man. <laughs> and it is just... Because they're so aiming funny. for an emotional reaction. Yeah. Yeah, both of them. And what is so funny to see from outside is that how can they not understand that they make the other side think that they're doing propaganda? Because this is bad propaganda. You're cutting out mm-hmm. part of the picture. Because the real picture is the women, the children, and the strong, intimidating men, they're all coming. It's not just one of the two groups. You right. know? And, and you know, th- th- that's something that's been very frustrating about um, and has made me react very often too quickly and emotionally to other people's sharing. So gladly in the last few years I've become rather less active on such topics unless i go to our to our fight club page <laughs> <laughs> but uh but that's that and um right and i think a lot of it is um people use the social media and everything else like that as a way to present what was actually an extremely propagandistic view of something but i think yeah. the problem to there too is is when we when we stand there from the outside and, and point to this as a propagandistic view that in itself will also lead to an emotional reaction because no one wants to see that that's what they're doing because what they're doing is they are legitimately producing something they feel makes a very important argument and it is closely tied to their identity to their you know to their emotion it it means something to them yeah Uh, so it makes it difficult to 
to have those conversations when each side is stuck within their own particular discourse, you know, and they can't really get out of that. You know, you just you just did something amazing. I, I have to grab my own nose, as they say in the Bible, uh, because, you know, what I was saying a while ago, it is patronizing to call other people racist. Well, I've done the same mistake. I've called other people propagandistic for something which they shared in good faith. And um, right. And that, that, that's a sense of good faith and authenticity. We, we often ignore that and we ignore where people are actually coming from. And we assume a kind of malign intent in it that probably yeah. isn't there. I think this is true for a lot of well-meaning liberals and leftists who do have really legitimate problems with conservative framing on issues. But yeah. they, um, they pursue things in a way that assumes a kind of viciousness or bad faith, and they ignore the, the good faith in the other person, that they actually yeah. have a particular perspective. And even yeah. if there's elements of that perspective that are very problematic, you're never going to get them to understand that if you come yeah. at it in that very antagonistic way, because it gets so yeah. caught up in our identities, we dig in our heels and no, this can't be true. Yeah, there's, there's this is something of... that, yeah, you see, it's not, and this really gets to, against the whole like, you know, absolutism about it, where one side assumes the other is sort of wrong or stupid there is that uh, we, we repeat the same arguments over and over again, because we're simply failing to recognize the humanity and the perspective and the identity of the other with whom we're speaking. And I think that it, it just, honestly, I'm, I'm very much an idealist. I, I want us to be able to talk more. Um, yeah. But the, the fight club aspects of it are sort of, they're, they're fascinating as a problem <laughs> because I think we need to yeah. find, we need to find a solution to it. We need to find a way out of it, which means we do need to understand where it's coming from. Anyway, I need okay. to wrap this one up here because actually my uh <laughs> i have a, I have a class that starts in three minutes <laughs> so yeah, i definitely need to too. to switch zooms <laughs> oh fuck. so yeah i i i, I this this um but yeah, it's fine I, I again i get caught up in these things and i quite enjoy the conversation so um, no, me too me too i actually had in my mind one more point uh that that i hope we would come to discuss Maybe we'll just mention it for the audience very quickly, and you, you, we can try to pick up on it. We can come back time. another day, yeah. Exactly, but basically one issue is also very important with identity is that identity is not something that you make in your basement, and then you come out and everyone has to accept it. And I think this has been a huge problem in the whole debates around using pronouns and how to address people. Uh, identity comes from interaction. You cannot predict how people will react to you and you cannot have expectations. It's just not healthy to have expectations. So it was for that reason, I was never really a big fan of the um, use my pronouns crowd, but um, maybe, um, and yet I did. I did use pronouns when, you know, I felt it was appropriate for a person that I knew was biologically of a different historical background, you could say. I did use the pronouns in moments because it came naturally, not because they asked me, but because it was the interaction that led to it. But and there is also... a kind, yeah, I, I, we we can we can come back to another, another time too because that's a, mm -hmm. that's another area that actually ends up being quite complex. I think mm -hmm. the point of the what the pronoun crowd is, is after is they want the uh, the social acceptance mm -hmm. of the roles that they've identified uh, adopted and respecting social roles is quite natural to people but when we we yeah. sort of like frame it in a particular way like there's a kind of preemptive discussion before you actually have that interaction and before there's the social because in mm -hmm. the social environment clearly you know the pronoun comes naturally but yeah. disconnected and especially on social media it has an artificial sense to a lot of people um yeah. and i think that's it it, just, it it complicates the discussions you know it makes it harder yeah. for people to understand why this is so important to them because it does come across as sort of forced so yeah but yeah we definitely got to pick it up a different day <clears throat> yeah yeah but yeah this is this is sort of fascinating i, I i've enjoyed this and you know, hopefully anybody that's going to be watching this is going to enjoy these little discussions of, uh, of identity and, you know, where we come from. So uh, just uh, once again, uh, this was uh, Evo and Liam O'Mara, and uh, this is Office Hours of the Mad Professor. And, uh, you know, if you like this kind of, uh, you know, crazy content, like and subscribe and all that business. And uh, we'll catch you another time.